We are Gold Ivy. Our mission is to empower you to own and unleash your truth. Stories of resiliency are gold and ivy grows in hard places. Those hard places are what creates space for light to shine through. You decide what works for your daily life and how to transform our lessons into your gold. This is Ivy Unleashed, a Gold Ivy production. You all know we're always sharing our favorite items that improve our health and help us feel better. So wait until you hear about this. NanoFit water. NanoFit water is alkaline water, which means it helps neutralize the acid in your body. It's triple filtered, which reduces unwanted chemicals and toxins. It's supercharged with nanotized oxygen, which hydrates the body at a cellular level. And it's all natural, meaning there are zero additives or artificial flavors. My biggest reason for adding NanoFit into my routine is for the performance and recovery benefits. As a runner, a faster pace and quicker recovery is what I'm after, and this water is a game changer. I feel better before, during, and after both cardio and strength training with the added oxygen and hydration benefits. And I'm here for the gut health and skin benefits. Alkaline water has colon cleansing properties, reduces the acid in my body, and the fact that NanoFit water is triple filtered, it's going to help with my gut health. And when my gut is on point, ooh, so is my skin. I'm against the waste of standard plastic water bottles, but NanoFit water is in 100% eco-friendly aluminum bottles that are shipped to your door by Amazon, taking the shopping hassle out. No more water bottles taking up a ridiculous amount of space in your cart or having to carry the heavy weight into your car and home. You're about to see NanoFit everywhere. They're in Starbucks, Kroger hospitals, and making their way to stores near you. We're thrilled to share its health benefits with you today so you can ship NanoFit water right to your door. NanoFit's mission is to help you feel better, function better, and sleep better, which we all want. So head on over to nanofitwater.com to order your case. It'll ship through Amazon. And use code GOLDIVY for a discount. Fit your lifestyle with NanoFit water. Brooke, what do you think everyone wants more of? Energy. What do you think most people are hoping to come out of 2023 with? Mm, feel more confident, be an example for others, actually have the self-discipline to take care of themselves. Yes, exactly. Because we hear the need for it and we want to help you get in the best shape of your life. We created Move with Gold Ivy, our virtual workout platform. Our dream has been to create accessible, affordable, and effective workouts that you can do anytime, anywhere, designed to hold you accountable and get you the results you need. You can pick any workout you want at any time, but if you do want a plan that alternates muscle groups and leaves your body feeling energized and strong, we have a weekly plan that you can follow to take the guesswork out. It's easy to navigate and packed with all kinds of workouts that will help you strengthen, trim, pump up, tone, energize, de-stress, all of the things we want our body to feel. It's within MOVE. Don't forget to mention the resources we offer. As a member of Move with Gold Ivy, you'll be a part of our exclusive Ivy League community where we share our top wellness resources on things like meal planning, gut health hacks, time management, and more. And because you listen to the Ivy Unleashed podcast, we want to offer you all of this for only $20 a month, cheaper than any monthly membership you'll find. Not only that, you'll get a free trial week to test it out. And if you need more incentive to start prioritizing you, here's our favorite part. Your movement matters. Each month, 10% of your membership will be donated to support the mental health of those in need. So head on over to goldivyhealthcode.com slash move or find the link within the show notes of this episode and sign up today. Stop putting yourself in the back burner. Snag your spot and reap the benefits that you deserve to feel this year. It's your time. Move for your health, move for your confidence, move for your mental clarity, move with Gold Ivy. And now to this episode of the Ivy Unleashed podcast. Welcome back to Ivy Unleashed. Thank you for being here. Today we are talking about something that is pretty deep. It can be a very emotional topic, so buckle up. We have a person here that we are thrilled to talk to because she has a beautiful podcast and creates content for people to feel like it's okay to feel the wounds that you have. So welcome to Ivy Unleashed licensed clinical social worker, Prunella Harris. 
Thank you all for having me. Thanks, ladies. I'm excited to be here. Uh, We are so excited. And if you are listening right now, it means that this title, this description intrigued you. Mm -hmm. You might have a parent wound. You might have some deep trauma within your own family. And we want this to be a safe place where we're just asking questions so we can learn more and then we can take the best next steps to get the help we need. Mm -hmm. And so I just want to give you a round of applause (laughs) if you're listening right now. Because it is not easy to do this work. And I would love, Purnell, for you to just start with why you are doing this work. Like I said, this is deep work. So what about this topic really gets you going? You know, a lot of times we have relationship issues. And I've seen so many people come through my practice who are struggling and they're putting a Band-Aid on a bigger, more in-depth core issue. It's usually that inner childhood work, but they're fixing the anger problem or they're putting a Band-Aid on, uh, you know, the attention-seeking behavior. And I just really think that if we sat with ourselves and started to dig into the mastery of self, we can uncover one, so much about ourselves, practice unconditional love and have the relationships that we want to have. And things will start to improve in our lives because the relationship that you have with yourself is reflected in the other relationships, whether that be with your children, your partner, uh, your coworkers, but it starts with you. Childhood is usually where we're formed, where we form our personality. So um, I'm excited to be talking about this topic with you guys. Yes, it's very intriguing to think about what you're attracting based off of what you've been through. Mm -hmm. And what's so great about Prunella's podcast, The Rise Station, is that she's an open book. So she's giving great advice and talking you through lessons that you may learn or that, you know, from her knowledge base. But she's an open book and likes to talk about her own experience, too. So we're so grateful that you're able to go there because I think it shows that you're a human being you know, and that you have a history and a past that makes you who you are. And so we would love for you to talk a little bit about your story, about your childhood, your parent wounds, and and how that kind of plays into how you help other people navigate through this. So our family is our first teacher. And I like to use my own personal stories because I want people to really connect that, hey, even though I'm educated, even though I have degrees and uh, social work, and I've studied this stuff, that I'm still human, and I can, you know, give it to you from both sides of the couch, right? So growing up, I grew up single parent household. My mother was very like, you know, driven, achievement oriented, but not very emotionally connected. She worked a lot. So I was always, my sister and I were always cared for by uh, relatives or even left home, but we never got that nurturing. So she was present, but she just, whether she wasn't nurtured as a a child, but she just could not be there for me emotionally. So it's just, you know, later on in my adulthood, I got married at 23 years old. I started realizing that I had codependent behaviors where I would try to earn love and I would try to, you know, show Um, how much I cared for someone by what I did. And I was, you know, achievement oriented, just like my mom, right? Just how she showed me how to be, you know, I did well in school. I um, earned my way through there. All my teachers loved me. I got a lot of attention for it. And I approached my marriage the same way. And when you are always trying to chase love, you will attract unhealthy love because you're using it as a a commodity. So when you give, 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 you attract takers. And I attracted someone who was not able to reciprocate the love that I wanted. And it just did not work out. So I am now divorced, (laughs) but those lessons, none of it was in vain because all those were very uh, much teaching me about myself, teaching me about healing, the inner child wounds that I inherited and really started anew so that I can change the next generation with my own children. I love that idea of thinking as any difficult situation as a teacher, whether it's a person, a parent, your own children, I think are the greatest teachers. I learned so much all of the time from them. 
And what I would love for you to just kind of explain, just for anybody kind of unfamiliar, what a parent wound is and what that can look like. Great question. So a parent wound is an injury that you would have sustained in childhood. Childhood is our formative years. Uh, So it's an injury in which your parent, whether it be your mother or your dad, wasn't emotionally available to you, wasn't able to show you the unconditional love that you deserved to help you feel safe, secure, and loved and cared for. So what happens when we are not provided with those basic needs is we start to adapt. We start to figure out how to maneuver the environment that we live in. Uh, There are different manifestations. There are some parents who are emotionally unavailable where they can't be vulnerable with their children. And that teaches the child to engage in love in a performative way because they're looking for connectiveness. So they're looking for a way to connect with their parents. So sometimes they will achieve so that the parents can say, oh, great, great job. Sometimes they will uh, do more emotional labor for the, the parents where they would emotionally caretake their parents for that attention. And then the flip side of that is parents who are overindulgent, who are controlling and dominating, and they take away choices from their child. So they never see their child as a individual, but just an extension of themselves. And so the child never gets to be seen, gets to be heard, gets to be their own individual. So they grow up and and they play that same role in their relationships where they're indecisive, they're unsure of themselves, they lack self-confidence, they needing constant reassurance. So those are just some examples of the parent and how it would manifest. Yeah. And you talk so beautifully about each, about the mother wound and the father wound, which we want to get into both Mm -hmm. today, but let's start with the mother wound. What are some of the biggest differences that the mother wound has that the father wound doesn't? The need for love and compassion, and it can be used as a commodity, so to speak. So when I think of how the mother wound manifests, it's different in men and women. It will show up differently in a female than it would. So a mother wound, a female who exhibits a mother wound will look different from a male who exhibits a mother wound. When you have those opposite genders, usually there's more competition when you have the female experiencing the mother wound because the mother wound can attack the self-concept of the female because the female is looking toward their mother to be the example. And the mother is looking at their child as competition. And there's some envy and jealousy. Whereas the son, the mother, uh, the boundaries are crossed where the mother will look at the son as a replacement for their mate. So requiring the son to be emotionally available to her, but not the other way around. So the son uh, can grow up with codependent behaviors because the mother is misusing the emotional connectedness of that relationship. Whereas looking at the daughter or the female child or the female gendered child as competition and sometimes will compete, even if there is a masculine person in the home, like a stepdad or a husband, the mother can feel threatened by the daughter and create a triangulation where she's competing over her spouse's attention and degrading the daughter. So there, there is different dynamics at play. Some ways that the mother wound does uh, manifest is the child not really feeling like they can be them, their authentic self. Having a tolerance for poor treatment of others, so allowing other people to walk over them. Being an emotional caretaker is another way that a mother wound can uh, manifest. Feeling like they're in competition with other women, not really feeling secure, not feeling like there are enough resources, so there's only room for one baddie, uh, so I have to take down all the other women that are here. I need to be the prettiest in the room, I need to be the smartest, but really competing. Um, They can also self-sabotage because they don't feel worthy of love. Being overly rigid and dominating um, is another way it manifests. Being emotionally unavailable themselves, learning from their mother, just not how to have emotions. And then choosing partners 
who are emotionally unavailable, who will reject them, who just won't ever choose them because that's what they're used to. You had asked about the difference between the mother wound and the father wound. The father wound, as it pertains to the daughters, are, you know, some ways, they call it daddy issues. Some ways that daddy issues will come up would be, you know, just trouble with boundaries, you know, oversharing, overgiving, fearing abandonment. So they're really entertaining things or treatment that is not conducive to their own well-being, but because they want them to stay. So people-pleasing behaviors, low self-esteem. If the father failed to give them love, then they don't really feel confident about themselves. So they look for external validation from others, other men, not being able to trust. You know, the father's present was inconsistent in their lives, so they don't trust that their partners are going to be there. They may have some anxiety around um, abandonment. Needing that constant reassurance we talked about as well. Clinging to relationships is another one. Craving male attention, engaging and promiscuous superficial relationships can be another way that you see that. And just choosing emotionally unavailable men as well is another way that manifests. It's so interesting how it's so many different manifestations of your emotional needs as a child not being met is what I'm hearing you say. Today's episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. Every episode of Ivy Unleashed is dedicated to empowering you to take ownership of your health. And what it really comes down to is prioritizing your mental health. We've both seen the beauty and growth that therapy can bring and are thrilled to partner with BetterHelp to allow you the opportunity to feel heard and seen by a professional. The National Alliance on Mental Health reports that 155 million people live in a designated mental health professional shortage area, and BetterHelp is working to close that gap. I've personally used BetterHelp and loved it because it was all online, making it super convenient. The biggest piece for me was how affordable it is. I was able to choose the therapist that met my needs. I came in with wanting to work on childhood trauma and anxiety, and it was unbelievable to see how many options I had with all the different backgrounds of therapists. With BetterHelp, you have access to a network of over 30,000 licensed and experienced therapists. Therapy is all about deepening your self-awareness. And sometimes we can't see our own patterns and behaviors until we talk them out and get an unbiased perspective. It's really nice to have someone who doesn't know you and has the professional background to help you thrive in your daily life. It has made the world of a difference with every relationship in my life, including the one with myself. To get started, all you have to do is fill out a brief questionnaire about your needs and preferences and choose your therapist out of the options they give you. You can talk to your therapist however you feel comfortable, whether it's via text, chat, phone, or video call. Also, you can switch therapists at no additional charge until you find the right fit for you. The best investment you can make is in yourself. Get 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash gold ivy. That's better h e l p dot com slash gold ivy. Take the first step to inner peace and freedom today. Vulnerable story alert. This message is for any person struggling with the embarrassment of excessive underarm sweating and or underarm odor. I've never shared this before, so bear with me. I am a big sweater. I swear I sweat when I think. I used to carry deodorant in my purses, car, backpacks. I did not go anywhere without deodorant, and I applied it dozens of times a day. I haven't been able to wear colorful t-shirts, long sleeve shirts, or sweatshirts since I was 16 due to excessive underarm sweating. And recently, one of my armpits started to smell like onions anytime it sweat. See, I told you this is a vulnerable message, but I wanted to let you know about a treatment I found that has changed my life. This treatment is called MiraDry and is for your underarms that greatly reduces sweating and odor. I have had one treatment so far, and I am a new woman. I can officially wear colored shirts without pit stains for the first time in decades, and my armpits no longer smell. I also no longer wear deodorant. I simply don't need it. Mirror Dry uses thermal energy that targets and eliminates the sweat glands in your underarm. Let me repeat that. 
you just need one to two treatments. It is the only FDA cleared treatment that can dramatically reduce underarm sweat by addressing the root cause of excessive sweat and its accompanying odor, not the symptoms. So if you're like me and have had to worry about pit stains from your sweat, excessive sweating even when resting, or planning your day around sweating, Mirror Dry is your solution. Not only has Mirror Dry erased my sweat problem, but also my armpit hair. I used to have to shave every single day. I am walking proof that Mirror Dry works. Once the glands are eliminated, they will not grow back. I absolutely love my Mirror Dry experience, and it was made affordable with a no interest payment plan. You can find a clinic that provides Mirror Dry all over the U.S., so head to MirrorDry.com to see where the closest location is for you. And don't wait another minute feeling embarrassed about your body. And they have these wonderful patient concierges who will answer all your underarm questions about the treatment. Thank you for letting me share this vulnerable information with you. I am walking proof that Mirror Dry is a life-changing treatment. Nobody should be embarrassed about their bodies, period. And if you want more information, Mirror Dry services will be linked in the show notes, and you can also message me directly to chat more about it. Now back to the show. I heard a quote that you said in episode 82 of your podcast. You said the mother wound manifests itself into codependent behavior and narcissistic patterns in adulthood. So I would love to unpack that. The codependent behavior and narcissistic patterns. What does that mean? So codependency and narcissism are the, are two sides of the same coin. So what happens is both of them, the same wound, it's a parent room wound. They did not get the love and attention that they needed as a child to feel secure. So what happens is the codependent says, I'm going to turn it outward. I'm going to give love. And hopefully one day someone will return that love. If you think about it, it's kind of manipulative because I'm going to do this to get that. you right. But it's turning outward, right? So I'm just going to keep giving, giving, giving. I'm going to do more than my fair share. I'm going to go above and beyond. And then one day people will see just how wonderful I am and love me one day, right? And so that's one side of the coin. The other side of the coin said, screw that. I can't count on anybody to give me anything that I need. I'm in this world by myself. Nobody is loving on me. So I'm going to lie, cheat, steal, control, dominate, get the love that I need by any means necessary. I'm turning it inward. I don't care about what other people uh, want, need. I am going to get my needs met by any means necessary. And so what happens is those two typically will attract each other. And that's where you get into a very toxic relationship. You'll have the codependent who gives, 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 and you have the narcissist who will take, take, take. For narcissists, treatment for them is very difficult because they don't see that they are the problem. If everybody else would just, you know, do what I want you to do, the world will be a better place. You just got to, you know, do what I want you to do. You don't have to have your own opinion. You don't need to do your own thing. Just do what I want you to do. Give me all your love and attention. Adore me. Put me on the pedestal and I'll give you nothing in return. Whereas treatment for the codependent is really starting with loving themselves. And they typically have a better efficacy rate of doing well in treatment once they learn how to love themselves unconditionally. Oh, that was a beautiful way to explain that and makes sense why they attract each other. I wonder where that comes from. So is the codependent usually from a parent that doesn't give or that does give? Like, is there a commonality there? So uh, codependence can be constructed by both, right? You can learn it, right? Because a lot of times if your mother if she didn't have good boundaries and she was always a caretaker of everyone else and you come along and want to do your own thing, oh, you're so selfish. Why don't you do, you know, think about other people and why don't you give to other people? So a lot of times as women, mostly, and this is what I see is we are trained to be putting ourselves last. We are trained to overgive and nurture, because that's what it means to be a good woman, a good wife, a good mother, a good person, a good churchgoer, right? 
not have boundaries, constantly serve other people without care for ourselves and things of that nature. So a lot of that can be cultural, can be passed down from generation to generation, but we can also learn it in the reverse where we can try to perform for, for, you know, because love is withheld like a commodity. Well, if you don't do this, then I'm not going to waste my time. If you don't do what I need you to do or behave in the way I need you to behave, I'm going to withdraw my love and attention from you. And you see that dynamic play out in narcissistic households. So the way I like to think about codependency and narcissists is boundaries. If there weren't healthy boundaries enforced in childhood, you can definitely have both narcissistic personality traits or codependent personality traits. So it doesn't necessarily mean that you're diagnosed with a disorder. You might just have some narcissistic tendencies. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Yeah. Well, and it makes sense too. It's like, I think it's good when you're listening to this to see where you identify with, Mm -hmm. you know, there's like no judgment here. This is just to notice, okay, I might do this because of what happened to me here, or I might be rebelling in the opposite way because I didn't get what I needed in this way. And so I just want to say like no judgment. And I think just try and be open to maybe where you fall here Mm -hmm. and maybe where you can see what your tendencies are. What are you typically attracting and what are you kind of more attracted to? That's what this journey is all about. The healing journey is all about you discovering who you are and mastering yourself. So I'm glad you said that because that right there illuminates this journey. It's really looking at all those things and going back and saying, well, these are the patterns that I've learned And does this fit my life or where I want to be? Yeah. And I think a tendency is to see it in everybody else and everybody else's problem. But I'd encourage everybody to kind of flip it, you know, learn, learn what you need to learn about what maybe you haven't uncovered yet about your parent wounds, but also just to notice like your shadow tendencies, maybe the darker parts of you that you don't really like, or you want to learn more about. I think when I think about a parent wound, I kind of think about reparenting yourself, right? I saw this quote about like, you know, if you look at who you are now, you're kind of the parent that you needed. Like you would have been safe to be with. So like my little seven-year-old self would have loved to have me as a mom, you know, because we learn from our parents. And so I think it's just kind of interesting to think about what did I need? What did I not get? And then how's it kind of showing up in ways that I don't really like and I don't want to keep attracting the circumstance? So have you done work that like that recently for yourself where you're still kind of uncovering how it's showing up? Yes. So I have been, well, I'm recently divorced. Um, My divorce got finalized in October. And I can tell you, not that I'm pro-divorce, But I don't think I, if I was still married, I don't think I would have evolved into the woman I am today. So it definitely caused a spiritual awakening. And and part of the things that it illuminated was the parent wound. Like, even though I've done all this, you know, self-healing work, there's still so much more to do. I really have been sitting with myself and it's a constant journey to make sure that I'm constantly checking in with myself and setting healthy boundaries because it is so easy for me to be a giver and I enjoy giving and giving feels good and it's good. It's just managing that, those boundaries where I'm now looking for relationships that are more reciprocal, being, you know, the person to say, uh, this, this isn't working for me. The way this, this, relationship is set up is no longer working for me. So I have to move away. And that, that is uncomfortable, but it's, I'm getting better at it. So, so it's, it's constant work and it's constant maintenance. The maintenance of it is so important so that it doesn't get passed down to generation, to generation, to generation. And so I'm curious with these parent wounds, how you in your practice have seen you know, or even just your study, how they do get passed down from different generations. You see them passed down by shame-based parenting, where 
if you want to be independent or if you want to get outside of a toxic family dynamic, you're shamed to, you know, folding back in. So there's a lot of guilt and you behave in those ways out of guilt. So doing anything outside of it is like, it, it causes so much anxiety. So for example, but this one particular client of mine is trying to create a path of her own, um, coming from a very toxic environment. And the issue is really with her mother in control. And everyone in the family is used to mom being in control. So when she says no, it's mom will triangulate. Now, triangulation is a, a, is a tactic that toxic individuals use to control another individual. What they'll do is rather than deal with the issue directly with the person, they will get another individual involved to team up against that person so that person, it's like a triangle. So that person will fall in line and, you know, the person in control can have more control. So everyone in the family is tied to this one central person with all the power and anyone who wants to live outside that, or even want to be independent is ostracized, is looked at as the black sheep and the family cuts them out. And so in order to get that connectiveness, they have to what? Fold. So that's what you see. And you see that play out, not just in like family uh, dynamics, but you also see that play out in marriages. You see just that level of control and domination. So self Love is not promoted. They don't want you to know how wonderful you are. They don't want you to care for yourself because then you're less likely to be malleable and controllable. So Pranel, what you're saying is because of this, that is why it's so hard to end the cycle. Am I hearing that right? Yes. Because because people that really like control don't like when you set a boundary because they are benefiting from you not having any. And it's easier to just collapse and fold in versus standing your ground. But it's not over time because then you keep having the same cycle. So it's a, it's a challenging thing to be a boundary setter. I'm a big boundary setter and I, <laughs> I'll admit it. And I'm even like, I'm working on being more gentle with my boundary setting because I am an outspoken person and I do have really high standards for myself and my relationships because I've seen how great it can be mm-hmm. when you have good boundaries. And so have you seen that go the opposite way where like you're really firm in your boundaries and so you push more people away? So those are rigid boundaries. So, I mean, we all want to be somewhere in the middle, Mm -hmm. but rigid boundaries are your walls are up. Nobody can penetrate, but you also can't get out of them either. So you isolate yourself from others by having too rigid boundaries. I'm private. I don't share anything about myself. I don't have, you know, work relationships over here and home relationship. Nobody needs to know about me. So your boundaries are very rigid and it doesn't allow you to connect with others. But then on the flip side, your boundaries are too porous, right? Where you're oversharing and overgiving and that could be harmful too. So you want to, you know, make sure they're somewhere in the middle. Yeah. How do you know if you are creating healthy boundaries? Like what are some signs that things are going well or maybe the opposite? So healthy relationship require healthy boundaries. So when you think of boundaries, I like to think of boundaries as a way to teach people how to connect with you. You know, a lot of people say teach people how to treat you. Well, that that too. Um, But it also, instead of keeping people out, is how can we connect in a way that is mutually beneficial, that I feel seen and heard and you can uh, see and hear me. So, you know, so it's a, it's a nice way to connect and be your authentic self. It should feel good to you. If it feels like you're giving too much, yourself will let you know. I mean, when you start betraying yourself, you'll feel it. It feels yucky. It feels like, you know, it's this ick that you get when you are upside down on those boundaries. And when you have four boundaries or you're doing more than your fair share, that's when you end up in those one-sided relationships and you start attracting takers. And so you start to feel exhausted. You'll start to feel like I'm being taken advantage of. Why aren't you doing any, you know, anything for me? Why aren't you calling to see how my day is? Why aren't you offering to do anything for me? And you'll start to feel that. 
So would you say boundaries are the ticket to ending this from passing down generation to generation? Yes. Okay. So we got to work on our boundaries, people. Boundaries is probably by far the best way you can show yourself Mm self-love by executing a boundary. When you do that, you're saying no to whatever the boundary you're setting up, but you're saying yes to you. So it is by far the best way to show yourself unconditional love. Yeah. And going back to just your concept of the self-growth and discovery, unless you do that work, you don't know what boundaries to set. That's why therapists are just angels on earth. (laughs) Well, for now, one big topic we really want to talk about with parent wounds is the wound of abandonment and how that can show up. Like, cause it's not a one you're abandoned in one way. So can you just talk about the wound of abandonment and how that shows up in your relationships? Um, so, you know, abandonment comes with that, um, just emotional unavailability of being seen and heard and, and having your, your parents acceptance and, um, connecting with your parents. When we don't, heal that abandonment wound, we get into relationships where we're sacrificing ourselves. And this is where those boundaries um, come in place. We're sacrificing our needs, our wants, and we're really going above and beyond to keep people in our lives, even if those people are toxic, even if they're not treating us well, but just because they're present, just because they're there. We're used to not getting any emotional nurturance. So we'll tolerate more than we should, and we'll tolerate mistreatment. We'll to- tolerate emotional, verbal, and even physical abuse just to have someone in our life, just to have a presence. Doesn't mean that they're treating us well. It's just because the fear of them leaving is so much worse. Well, we know the evil that we have. We don't want to let that go. That's where we have um, individuals who are clingy. Uh, They may um, be in a really terrible situation, but end up staying um, longer than they need to, putting up with things that they don't need to because they fear abandonment. Uh, And the way out is exactly what we talked about with, you know, one, understanding that they're worthy of love and giving that love that they are giving to other people and chasing love to themselves because the fear of abandonment is strictly you put the uh, focus and locus externally where if you really looked at it, you can't abandon yourself. But the fear of abandonment means that you're abandoning yourself and you're, you know, putting your efforts into maintaining things outside yourself. But if you were to turn that around, and start loving yourself unconditionally because you're the one who is always there with you. No matter how tough a situation, you're the one pulling yourself out of it. Somebody could be there to hold your hand, but you're the one doing all the work to get yourself out of depression, to get yourself out of the, the anxiety, to get yourself out of you know the, the crying controllably at night because you're not being treated well. You're sitting with yourself and you're always there. So once you start realizing that it was you the entire time and you start appreciating who you are and loving who you are, that fear of abandonment is, is, is null and void because I love myself unconditionally. We're going to be okay no matter who comes or goes. We're going to be just fine. Do you ever see the opposite happen where people attract the same type of scenario as their parent? Yes. And that happens way more than not. We often will attract partners that are identical to the parents that we have unresolved issues with. And what we try to do is in our relationships, we try to resolve them. So that ends up coming up where, okay, well, I couldn't fix it with my dad, but I'm going to try to fix it here and I'm going to be demanding it. But we're actually doing the same things. We're doing the same things because we're still chasing love. We're still chasing it rather than saying that energy, that effort that I'm putting in to saying, I need this, I need this is no, I'm going to pour into myself. I'm going to work on healing those things. Now, here's the scary part. 
Because as you heal those things, if your partner isn't growing in the same trajectory, it then makes you unaligned. And so as you grow, you will no longer tolerate emotionally unavailable because you are expecting reciprocity. And so that's what happens. And that's where people usually call me because of I'm working on myself. You know, I've tried to get my partner in. They refuse to change. They refuse to grow. They refuse to meet me halfway. So now I can no longer expand in this. I'm working on myself and there's no more room for me to expand in this relationship. And I'm not coming down because I love who I am. So now I have to make a decision. That makes so much sense because everybody that we follow in the self-growth development world, they all get divorced <laughs> because they're working so hard on themselves. So I need to make sure my husband knows he's got to keep growing too. <laughs> but that's why like you should both be in therapy. Like therapy's for everyone. And that's tricky to think about healing something and then your partner hasn't healed. Mm -hmm. You know, it. that's a great, I'm, glad, I'm really happy you brought that up. How do you know if someone is emotionally available? They're They're vulnerable. They can sit with your um, emotions and they don't make you feel bad about having emotions, but they can hold space for you and they can communicate effectively. They can disagree without being emotionally manipulative or trying to win you over uh, on their side. And they're socially intelligent as well. One thing I would bring up is for the longest, I thought I was emotionally available Right. I thought I did all this healing work and I was emotionally available, but I kept attracting emotionally unavailable men. And what was happening is I was a little bit more emotionally available, but I would attract the unavailable men is because it made me feel good to say, let me love you, even though I knew they could not return that love, because in my mind, it made me feel like I was emotionally available. But the moment, and this is this is the tricky part, because the moment I did come up with someone who was emotionally available, it was like, whoa, wait a minute, we, you're a little too clean, right? This feels a little uncomfortable. And so it will help you, it reflects back to you, the wounds that you still need to work on. So this, again, is self-mastery. It is, you know, it's a, a process, like, you know, we the fun of life is figuring it out. Like it's, it's the journey. It's okay. We're going to make some mistakes. We're going to, you know, have to revamp and keep revamping. So just go in with an open heart and an open mind and just, you know, willing to just keep working. Yeah. And I love how you just said that. I think that's beautiful to think about. It can be a beautiful process. It can be just, you're learning about yourself and how you can have more connection. And I think one thing I think that's important to talk about is why it's important to go back and figure out what the wound is, right? Should we just move on and just like make progress forward? Why is it important to kind of explore this parent wound and really address exactly where it comes from and get into the nitty gritty with it? When you don't go back and do the research, you don't have the full picture. You're just plugging holes, the band-aid. You're just putting band-aids on what you see right now rather than what was formed. And each person is going to reflect a different part. So if you go back to the beginning, you could see the whole picture and how that happened and what the needs were that you didn't get versus right now you might have done some work, but there you know might be something else. And the only way to know is if you get with someone who brings out the worst in you and you know that could be catastrophic. You know, there's no right or wrong way to do the healing, but the clearest picture uh, is to go back to the earliest versions of yourself where life and the experience of toxic relationships, because, you know, because you've had that wound for so long, it has manifest and even grown due to the other relationships that you've had. I think doing that inner child uh, work is helpful because that's who shows up every time that inner child who was not loved shows up. Every single time you're in a relationship that reminds you or that triggers that wound. So you get back to the source, you can uncover it, clean it out, and then everything else can uh, fall away. Pranella, this is when I get really like, how am I going to not do this to my kids? Right? Because I can't meet all their emotional needs 
they're going to be their seven-year-old self in their marriages. Like, ah, that is so much pressure. And I know like I can't do it perfectly. And I need to apologize when I make a mistake and stuff. But that like being a parent is like the most important role in someone's life, how they're going to show up for the rest of their life are the ages that my kids are right now. So I am like reading my Bible and doing all my reflection, but like what advice do you give parents who are shitting their pants about not messing their children up? Well, I probably have messed mine up. So I, no, I'm just, you know, we have to understand that we are here to help our children guide them and not take away any challenges. So the challenges in life, now life is going to throw challenges. We're not going to you know, be perfect parents. But school is, you know, they might have some challenges at school, at work. Um, it is not preventing them from going through those challenges. It's helping them get the coping muscles to be able to maneuver whatever life throws your way and know that, hey, I'm going to be here emotionally for you, help you pick up the pieces, help them, you know, be able to deal with life as life comes. So we don't have to have the answers or the shield or shield them from it because they actually need a bit of challenges to be able to deal with the world that we live in. We were just talking about this right before we started airing because of, you know, when your kids have issues with other little kids, you want to just step in and mama bear. And it's like, Ugh. you know, we need to teach them to be resourceful and they need to learn to get their feelings hurt and stand up for themselves. And it's, it's, tough because your instinct wants to just take care of the problem. I think it's also what, I mean, I'm not a parent, so I can't speak on that, but I can imagine that a big piece of it is just being vulnerable with your children. Right? I think about what I wish I had as I reflect on my parental wounds and it's having a parental figure show you that it's okay to have emotions and how to process these emotions and feel your feelings and that it is a safe place. So it's like you are already providing that for your kids and the rest of it is just like circumstantial of who the hell knows what this world is going to throw at us. But if they know that they have security in their home, like that's everything. I'm curious your thoughts on that, Pranella. I agree. 100%. You said it perfectly. You know, we think about our our seven-year-old self, our younger self, and being that parent, reparenting. And it's almost like no matter what your situation is, you're always going to have that inner child. You cannot be the perfect parent, like you said, Andrea. Uh, But there is still that resentment that comes up of wishing it was different, right? Like that's the healing journey in itself is practicing forgiveness and knowing like, all right, I got to deal with this on my own. But what, what advice do you have, Pranel, for practicing this forgiveness while also processing the resentment and the anger? Because that healing, it's, it's like a roller coaster. (laughs) You know, forgiveness is, is a big one and living and practicing forgiveness, something that is solely for you. One is understanding that you are entitled to your anger and you are entitled to feel how you feel about past events and things of that nature. And then making that choice to to say whether or not I want to forgive and making that choice to forgive, understanding what it means for you and not forgiving for someone else, because this forgiveness process and practicing forgiveness is a solo act. You don't have to call someone on the phone. Guess what? I forgive you. All these years, I forgive you. No, it's an internal shift. It's a it's an internal shift to say, you know what? Part of loving me is releasing any pain, any harm that people have done and really transmuting. I, I like to say transmute that energy, alchemize the, that pain into something purposeful or something productive, right? Because we can't go back to the past to correct whatever has happened, but we can make use of what has happened. Every moment in our life has caused us to be the person we are today. If we had changed anything, we would be less of who we are. We would not have the lessons. So the forgiveness process is to 
make room for you to open up and love, make room for you to be vulnerable, make room for you to love yourself and say, I don't deserve this event that caused me so much pain to keep control in my life. I want to start practicing unconditional love for myself. And part of doing that is making sure I'm not walking around with all this ick in here. I'm not walking around with reliving the past over and over and over again. And I'm not constantly attracting people from my past because whatever you think about more often is what you give your energy to. And that's what you give your power to. And so you take back your power when you do choose to forgive, but it is a choice. It is a choice to lay down those burdens, to say, I want different for me because this is just causing me depression, causing me anxiety, causing me mental anguish, not being able to trust others. It's just having all that impact on my life. And this is how I choose to narrate the story. I choose to tell it from a place where I am triumphant over my thoughts and feelings. Yeah, that choice, bringing it back to you're not a victim. You are the director of how you are choosing to view these things and the imagery of releasing it, of the heaviness, the weight, it, that really spoke to me because that's something that months ago I chose to forgive and it wasn't easy. And I feel like it, it is a, a practice, right? It's those feelings come in and it's that awareness of, oh, I'm having these thoughts that are making me feel really heavy and really closed. And nope, if I don't want to feel that pain, I don't have to feel that pain. You know, it's it's like an imaginary thing. It still is it happened, right? The hurt is there, like you said, acknowledging it, feeling the feelings, but releasing that energy. And you have a, a really beautiful four phases that you broke down on your Instagram that I saw. And it was uncovering, deciding or decision, recovery and growth. So will you just walk people through those four phases just to kind of give people who are listening and are like, all right, I got to forgive. Let, let me work on this. Let me see what stage I can be in to progress to the next one. Okay. So the uncovering covering phase is like ripping the bandaid off, looking at the wound, looking at how that person has hurt, hurt you, what the injustice was, uh, how did it impact you. Uh, then the decision, which is the next phase, is deciding what are the pros and cons of me continually holding on to this resentment or forgiving. How can this better my life? And then making the choice to start working toward that. And you could do, you can journal through these phases. I, I recommend journaling through these phases because a lot of times we like to see them uh, on paper, get those thoughts on paper. The next phase is the work um, or recovery um, phase. That's where you're doing most of the work, right? That is when you are deciding to look at the people who harmed you the people who have caused you anguish, betrayed you in a compassionate way, through a compassionate lens. Well, what was going on in their life at the time that they treated me this way? What were what what lessons did they learn from their childhood? What did were they uh, mistreated as a child? But looking at them in a compassionate way, which is difficult, you know, if they've harmed us, it's it's difficult, but necessary in the journey of forgiveness. Not to say we condone their behavior, not to say we minimize our our pain, but just understanding who they are um, as an individual. And then the last phase, which is the growth phase, is what has this taught me about me? How has this event that has caused me so much anguish, so much uh, pain. How has this made me a better person? How has this transformed me into the person I am today? How did I grow from these lessons? What do I know more about myself now that I didn't know because of this event? And that's how we practice forgiveness. Yeah, that's beautiful. I think it's nice to have words on mm -hmm. it, right? Because we all want to be at a place of peace. We don't want to hold on to this, you know, like you literally get sick holding on to these big, huge emotions and not being able to release them. And I loved what you said about alchemizing it. Like you don't have to forgive and forget. I don't think this is my belief. I think you can alchemize it into something else, right? Especially if you go through that process, then you're, I mean, you are alchemizing it into 
bettering yourself in the end, right? And then being able to have more connection with that person or with other people based off of what you learned about yourself. When you forgive, you don't ever have to have a relationship with that person either. Like if they've done something that is unsafe and you can maintain boundaries, um, you can forgive and still decide that you don't want to um, reconcile a relationship with them. I have a question about forgiveness. If the person has passed and you don't have a choice in that conversation, would you say that process is still the same of forgiveness within yourself if you don't have a choice of being able to speak with them? Well, because forgiveness is a solo act, you don't necessarily need to speak to them. That would be reconciliation. And a lot of people will intertwine those two uh, terms. Reconciliation is about making amends. Um, It's about getting the relationship back on track. But forgiveness is a really solo project. It's really about releasing toxic, harmful emotions out of your system and an energetic shift for you. Yeah. I was just thinking about with parent wounds, if you don't, if your parent isn't living and you're holding on or you're learning about how they affected you. I bet that's so challenging not to have a conversation with them. Once you've finally been able to let it go, I bet there's like a piece of you that isn't really, doesn't have the closure maybe that, that you'd, you'd want to have. Yeah. I can see how that could be challenging, but I think you know, if that is the situation, you can provide yourself with peace by being able to work through and release those burdens so that you can move through the grief process um, and the grief phases by doing that solo work mm-hmm. of forgiveness. So I'm so happy you're doing what mm-hmm. you're doing because yeah. the way that you put terms on it, you can see yourself in it in any, I can like see 50 different relationships as you're talking. And so I'm so happy that you're doing the work that you're doing and that you have a podcast so we can tap in and listen to you anytime. And so we would love for you to share where people can find you on Instagram, online, your podcast, all of it. I am on Instagram at Restorative Family. I also have Facebook on Restorative Family Services. Our podcast is Rise Station Podcast, and you can find us on all uh, platforms. We are on Apple, we're on Spotify, um, Amazon, uh, Google, uh, wherever you listen to podcasts, you'll find us there. You can also um, visit our website at www.restorativefamilyservices.com. Yes. I love the of all those resources because you said it's a solo project. Yes, but we weren't meant to do it alone. This is self-discovery and you are turning inward, but you're doing it in a safe place and therapy is such a beautiful way to do it. So again, thank you for the work you're doing, for making it more accessible, using social media for good, for healing. That's what we love to see. And we would love for you to share your three gold stars with our listeners. So three takeaways you want to leave our audience with. Understand that your parents are not evil people. They probably just didn't have the tools that they needed to give you what you needed. So that actually is just a a global. Okay. That's not one of my takeaways. Don't, don't count that one. Okay. (laughs) But one is I want you to be intentional about your own healing, right? Really set aside time uh, each day to work on something. It doesn't necessarily need to be any specific like parent wound, but just work on yourself because that is, again, showing yourself unconditional love by putting aside time and working on yourself. Number two is practice unconditional love for yourself. That means forgiveness. That means being self-compassionate. Like, hey, if you falter during this healing process, it's okay. Get back on a horse, keep working it. Progress, not perfection. Be kind to yourself. Don't criticize. Just, you know, keep making uh, progress each and every day. The last one is the one we've been talking about, which is number three is set healthy boundaries. That is the best way you can show love and appreciation for yourself is by really saying yes to you and no to some things. Um, Don't overextend yourself. Don't overgive. Don't overshare. Protect your time boundaries. So really setting up healthy boundaries and relationships so that you can call into your life healthier relationship. Beautiful. Love those. Thank you. And next up is Unleashing Ivy. So questions that you have no idea that we're about to ask. Uh (laughs) (laughs) Uh-oh. Are you ready? I think so. All right. I'll go first. 
I'm just going to be selfish here and go with a, a question that may help me grow and might help my relationships and me not hurt anybody's feelings or make rooms awkward. <laughs> um, I'm an overshare. You know, I have a podcast and I share everything. But I'm curious on how you kind of reel that back in or like maybe tools to discover why you're doing that, why I'm doing that, why I'm sharing every detail about my life the second I meet anybody. Practice not sharing so much would be to listen more uh, than you you speak. Sometimes it could just be our need to want to connect and 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 want to um, have people like us. So if we allow other people to contribute more, then that, that means we're listening and we can respond more to them. So it kind of flips it a little bit. But then also understanding the levels of friendship. I guess. T.D. Jakes, I don't know if you um, listen to T.D. Jakes, but Bishop T.D. Jakes does a sermon and he talks about the three levels of of friendships where you have like confidants, constituents, and comrades. Go ahead and watch that one. There are different levels. So different people get different versions of us depending on their, our, um, you know, bond to them. So confidants are the ones who you want to share more intimate details, right? And then your constituents are people you want to share less and comrades, not nothing at all, nothing, (laughs) not too much at all, because those, those are individuals who uh, you share an enemy. And the more you share with the comrades, the more that can be used against you. So it's really categorizing different people, different personnel, and really adjusting how much you share based on that. Oh, I love that. And I also, I was in a therapy session one time where my therapist was talking about that. Like if you were to gossip or talk about someone or you have someone in common that you're talking about, that that's not actually bonding. Like that is not bonding time. You are not having a true connection there or same with oversharing. Like it's not true connection. If you're just blabbing people's ears off, like you said, you're not even listening to hear about them and connect with them. So it's, it's definitely something that I'm working on. (laughs) So thank you. We're all working on something. (laughs) Yes. My question piggybacks off of that because in episode 89 of your podcast, you say instead of trying to change a person, change the way you let yourself get affected by them. So if you are having a conversation with someone who they think it's connection, but you don't, how do you productively come to that conversation with maybe it's the boundaries that you're setting, the things you're saying, not letting that energy affect you? Honesty. You know, I think allowing people to see who you are and just really speaking, you know, what it is that you need from your connections. And so when you can be authentic, you allow them to make the decision whether or not they want to engage. And that's, again, a healthy boundary. Um, It also can work for you because it'll be a sifting tool. If you tell them, yeah, I don't like you talking so much, they may decide not to talk to you. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's like, oh, this works. So it's it's really teaching people how uh, you like to connect. And if you are not really, feel, I've had to tell people, like people would try to gossip and I really don't like us. I think it's draining and I, I just don't like, it, it's not good for my energy. So I have told people, that listen, I'm not really into gossip and they won't, they will either decide not that I'm not the friend for them, which is fine, or they will not gossip with me. Both are still what I want. Like if you, if it's, if it's one of those colander effects where it kind of like sifts away the people that you are not aligned with, then that's okay. But you got to be really comfortable with losing people out of your life to get to that point. Yeah. I think it's boundary. When I think about boundaries, I think about being honest with yourself, what you need, but then also being honest with the people around you of what you need. And that can be scary. So this is why we're working on the self-discovery, the boundaries and why we have you. So thank you. Yeah. The more (laughs) uncomfortable it is, that's where the growth is though, right? It feels uncomfortable. So they say. (laughs) And you usually can tell someone who's a solid friend if they respect your boundaries. If you set a boundary with someone and they're like, oh, no, we can't be friends, then they probably were toxic in the first place and you just dodged a bullet. Amen. (laughs) All right, Prunella, our last question is, if you could go back and tell younger Prunella something, what would you tell her? I would tell her that 
you are amazing just the way you are. You don't have to do anything. You're enough. I want everybody to take that in for yourself because it's so true. And it's heartbreaking that little kids are walking around not feeling enough, you know, and they take on everything that their parents do, that it's their fault, you know, and it's, it's something we carry the rest of our life with. And that's why this work is important. And that's why you are so important, Pranella, that you're doing this work because we need you. (laughs) Thank you. And you guys for, you know, bringing awareness to this issue and what you guys do is amazing as well. Oh, thank you. Thank you. This has been awesome. We can't wait for everyone to go get a piece of you. Thank you for your time. We know it is so valuable. And last but not least, we leave our listeners with a piece of gold, a quote that you love. Will you please share yours? I have a quote from Jesse Jackson, and it is, you may not be responsible for being down, but you must be responsible for getting up. This is Gold Ivy signing off. Listen to your truth and go chase your gold. (laughs) 